Life is unfair. This became the running motif in Famisha's life, because in her world, people received magic blessings at the age of five. Blessings ranked by number of stars, with five stars being the highest and most coveted in their society. She was blessed with the skill to tame monsters, only with zero stars, a completely and utterly worthless rank, as she couldn't even tame small, meekly animals. The acceptance in the village she grew up in became rejection. The love she received from her parents became hate. She was forced to flee from her hometown while being chased by bounty hunters employed by her village. She changes her name to Ivy to take on a new identity. She cuts her hair so she can pass as a boy to avoid the hunters. She hasn't given up on life because there is something special about her. She was reincarnated from our world into the girl she is now, and the voice of her past gives her advice on how to live and who to be. She eventually meets a tiny slime who she befriends named Sora. And now the weakest duo is on a quest to reach the capital, where she's been told she'll receive the purpose she's been missing. This is a heartfelt tale of the weakest tamer began a journey to pick up trash. And in this episode, Ivy heads back to Otowa, where even in this big bustling town, not everything is as it seems, learning there is a criminal organization abducting children behind the scenes. If you're new to the series, you can watch the last two videos that cover everything from the very beginning. They'll be linked in the description. So let's get started and watch the story unfold. It's another great morning. Ivy, having rested peacefully at the Blazing Sword camp, goes for her usual trash dump run, discovering some potential breakfast portions for Sora. Some slimes walk by to dissolve some of the trash, meaning there's another monster tamer here. It's Mila who commands her slimes Lasto and Lidl to continue disposing of the trash. Apparently, they're rare slimes that have the ability to consume swords, and those who control rare slimes are afforded high social standing, meaning Mila has tons of connections. Ivy asks Mila if she's ever seen a disintegrating slime before, but she hasn't. Because it's super rare, if managed to be caught, it could be easily sold for a large sum. Ivy then all of a sudden feels a presence that makes her sick, the same presence she felt when she was being chased by the dark wind. Mila tries to ask her what's wrong, but before Ivy can explain, Latra comes along with other adventurers to dump their trash. Turns out, those ogres were tough to deal with, so they have tons of weapons that are worn out and they need Mila to dispose of them. Also, with the ogres being completely extinguished, the group is now returning to Otolwa. They celebrate at night with drinks and Ivy serving them skewers. And delicious cocoa meat soup as well. The whole gang is impressed by the various cooking techniques Ivy has accumulated. As they enjoy themselves, Ivy worries about Ciel, since the group said they had eliminated all the monsters. But Ivy's past self reassures her that if they were fighting her Adondola, there'd be a huge fuss and everyone would know about it immediately. And she's right, Ciel is yawning away from the camp. The entire group gathers around Ivy and Mila introduces her older twin brothers, Tolto and Malma. The three make up the Green Gale group. The twins come by and praise Ivy as their sister had mentioned how intelligent she was and wanted Ivy to join their group when she grows up. However, Latra butts in saying, no way since Ivy is going to be his little brother. But Sezel gives him a good smack telling Latra to stop messing around. At the sight of the adventurer group Lightning King approaching, Mila and her siblings decide to leave the scene. Apparently the twins Tolto and Malma aren't comfortable around Lightning King's captain, Barolda. However, She's happy with the captain affirming Ivy should be traveling with Sezelk back to town. Back in her tent, Ivy releases Sora so he can have his meal, bringing out tons of portions she was able to procure from the trash piles, making Sora cheer so loud she needs him to quiet down. While the two relax, Ivy feels the same sickening presence from earlier. She decides to hide Sora away as the presence draws closer, but it just suddenly disappears. Outside her tent, Latra calls out to her. Turns out, he was hoping Ivy would help him cook tomorrow's breakfast in the morning. However, with him leaving, she's still wary of that strange presence she felt. She goes back inside and wonders if Latra could potentially be the source of the presence. Sora tries to explain, however, it's meaningless because Ivy doesn't get it. She wonders if tamers with stars like Mila would be able to understand what he's saying. He begins a staticky vibration, reminding Ivy of how he was shaking those times when they passed by the guy with the illegal alcohol and the gang of murderers. She decides to ask Sora about Latra, Sezel, Noga, and Shifal, and Sora responds cheerfully. However, when hearing Mila of the Green Gale, he begins his fearful shakes, indicating she must be the source of the sickening aura. At the Otowa village gate, the gate guard tries to check Ivy with name and originating village. However, 
when proving Captain Ogto from Latome is her guarantor using her bank tablet, she is granted permission with a simple name signing. Entering in, she stares in awe at the big bustling town of Atolwa. They decide to set a place to rest at the Adventurer's Clearing, where Sezelk explains even though they had just finished clearing the monsters surrounding the area, they all can't go home yet as there are dangerous people also causing a problem. Barolda adds that people are being abducted and sold into slavery by a criminal organization. The town watch located their hideout and raided it earlier, but it seems the information was leaked and the hideout completely deserted. It deeply angers Sezelk to know people are being abducted, but there have been no reports of any suspicious character sightings. Ivy's particularly worried after learning she is the prime target. This organization primarily targets children. The entire group wishes they had some sort of lead or clue, so Ivy decides to share her experience of almost getting attacked, making everyone gasp in astonishment. A man from Barolda's group then releases a barrier so they can discuss without any outside ears listening. Ivy then recounts her story of being chased in the forest by a sickening presence before she met Blazing Sword. But when a monster, aka CL, appeared, the presence ran away. The group praises Ivy on her particular talent of sensing things, which she had acquired living in forests alone for the last few years. She then talks about the dark presence she felt back at camp that had disappeared when Latra came by, making Sezelk suspect the star of Blazing Sword. However, Latra clears himself with his alibi being he had just come by to ask Ivy to help him make breakfast and Nuga suspects the appearance of Latra made the one with the dark presence flee. She begins to explain the real culprit as Mila, but when asked for evidence, she recalls Mila saying such a rare slime could be sold at a high price, and the adventurer group who had tried to steal Sora from her. She couldn't stand the thought of more people coming after Sora, so instead of elaborating further, Ivy tells them to forget what she said. Night comes, and in her tent, Ivy has no idea what to do, given she can't just tell people about him. Sora just lightly affirms with his constant poo 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 phrasing, making Ivy wonder if he's trying to say it's alright if she tells them about him. Ivy then remembers when Luba had told her all secrets will eventually come to light, and that one day, Ivy would need people who will fight beside her. In the morning, she sees her allies in the clearing. She's about to make breakfast, but Sezelk stops her for the secluding barrier to cast around them. Bad news, they did in fact find out about a darker side to Mila of the Green Gale, and her older brothers as well. After hearing Ivy's tip yesterday, they decided to track Mila's every movement, and they spotted Green Gale doing some clandestine business with a traveling merchant. One of the men from Barolda's group tried even testing them as the merchant was leaving, and everyone from Green Gale only claimed they were giving direction to a lost man. But they're especially suspicious, also using a sound barrier like this one to prevent their conversation from leaking. They'd never use it to simply give directions. Shifal also looked into the merchant at the trading guild, but learned the merchant wasn't conducting any business in this town. Putting it all together, a merchant from another town using a costly magic item that prevents sound from leaking, yet not conducting any business? The team is upset, as many of them are good friends with Mila and her brothers. However, Sezel is glad they finally have a lead to the abductions. Ivy is surprised they believed her so easily without too much evidence. So Latra asks her why she makes food for them. She replies, it's because she wants everyone to enjoy the things they eat. That statement alone and the way Ivy behaves is all reason enough for them to know she's not a person who would lie to them. Hearing this makes her smile. Her eyes gleam. She thinks she's nothing to anyone and yet they still trusted her. She then reveals to them she is in fact a tamer and the slime she tamed was the one who told her about Mila. She brings them back to her tent and introduces Sora, and everyone stares in awe as they've never seen a rare transparent slime before. She's not sure why, but Sora somehow has the ability to see through bad people, and immediately, Barolda and Sezelk understood why Ivy had to keep Sora a secret, since the rarity of the slime could have brought pursuers after them. So, everyone in the group promises to keep him a secret. One of the men named Rickvelt begins to pet the cute slime, and Latra brags about Ivy, singing Ivy's praises because he found him first. Apparently, transparent slimes are only ever heard of in legends and stories, all while Rickvelt continues to pet Sora with his head, only for him to get pulled away by Shifal and beaten up. After recovering from his pounding, Rickvelt decides to test Sora's ability to see through evil. He claims himself to be Latra of the Blazing Sword, which makes Sora spaz out like all the other times he'd come across wrongdoers. But they already mentioned his name, so Sora might just not like Rickvelt from the excessive petting. The man with the blonde hair 
then tries next, claiming his name to be Maurik, which of course causes Sora to spaz when we learn his name is actually Lokrik. <laughs> Man, I don't know if I can keep going on with all these weird names. But anyways, Maurik is actually the bald guy above him who secretly drank all of Shipal's alcohol last night. Something Sora confirms is true. However, Shipal isn't happy about his missing alcohol, giving Maurik a nasty look, chasing after him and beating him up. As the group eats their meals under a barrier, Seizelk remarks on how he never expected the traitors to be from the Green Gale group. Baralda then adds that it makes sense since they've never been able to find any clues on the kidnapping organization. The enemies had been hiding in plain sight all along, but now, knowing Mila, Tolto, and Malma are the traitors, it'll make it easier to snuff out the rest of the villains. Ivy agrees with a saddened tone, prompting Latra to ask if it's hard for Ivy to think of Mila as a bad person. And he's right on the money. He's apparently known Mila ever since they were kids. For Rickvelt, Malma is a good friend of his as well, which is why he wants to stop him with his own hands. No one is happy to have to detain their friends. Baralda then explains the kidnapping incident started around 10 years ago. People thought that kids were going missing because they'd fallen victim to monsters. But seven years ago, Baralda and Sezalk's group discovered the existence of the clandestine organization when they had taken some of the victims who had escaped under their protection. Ivy then concludes there must be other traitors in the organization, causing everyone to audibly gasp. If the organization has been around that long, there has to be more than just one team of traitors. Sezelk agrees, bringing up that time again when they had raided the criminal's hideout to find nobody. Knowing there were only a handful of people other than the Green Gale that could have exposed their plans. A bigger problem is that the Green Gale's promotion was endorsed by a member of the nobility, which is why Barolda's group trusted them. This isn't usual, as most nobles actually look down on adventurers. So why would they promote the Green Gale to other high-ranking adventurer groups? The gang then gets annoyed as they couldn't figure out how obvious it was that this particular noble is involved, something even a seven-year-old could figure out. But Ivy starts to whine hearing that. Even though she doesn't look like it, she's a 9 year old. Her birthday is at the end of the 8th month, and she just happened to turn 9 today. Upon hearing this, everyone begins wishing Ivy a happy birthday and clap for her, causing her to blush and thank them. The current situation is more dire, so Latro proposes a proper birthday celebration later, instead of just these well wishes. However, Ivy assures him these are more than enough. She smiles warmly, wondering how many years it's been since someone had told her, Happy birthday. Latra then questions if she's really 9 though, because at times, she says things and cooks so well, she seems much older, probably because of the insight from her past self. Getting back to the task at hand, they decide to figure out who else they can trust in this town. They head to the Adventurer's Guild to test the Guildmaster, Rogleaf, or Mr. GM. Sora seems to react positively to him. Then, the Captain of the Watch, Berksby, introduces himself. Sora is still positive. And finally, Captain Agra, and Sora is still fine. Barolda pulls out a little crystal and observes the three, saying it's a magic item that can tell if someone who has spoken is good or bad. This is of course to prevent the exposure of Ivy's rare slime. Ivy makes the excuse that the item only lasts for a week before it becomes a useless stone, so Rogleaf tells them he'd like the gang to use it to uncover members of the criminal organization. That way, they can find the traitor who passed on the information about their investigations. He then orders all adventurers to be summoned here. The gang then heads to the merchant's house that the criminal organization had used as their base. To preserve as much evidence as possible, watchmen stand guard while they continue to investigate. Captain Berksby introduces the two guards to Ivy. However, Sora reacts to the second guard with green hair, Malgaljala. Ivy signals Barolda and Latra walks up to build simple rapport, and it's clear Berksby is pissed at his subordinate. They walk inside and Vice Captain Agrop isn't happy because he really trusted that guy. However, all the Watchmen were summoned here too, so they intend to dig up every single criminal that's a part of the kidnappings. Day turns to evening, and everyone is exhausted. No one is happy to find out that out of 150 Watchmen, 38 of them are traitors, meaning all their previous moves were for sure leaked. Then appears Count Faltoria and Lord Faranda to congratulate them on their work in investigating the crime scene. But we know they were really here to discover all the traitors. When the two introduce themselves to Ivy, Valtoria triggers Sora, making it clear he's a noble that's a part of the big crimes. However, Faranda checks out as a good guy. When they leave, everyone is disappointed because Valtoria is a hero to this town. But everything makes sense now, as there had to be someone powerful 
in control. Captain Berksby's emotions spiral, remembering all the failed raids and the allies that were killed in combat. He punches the wall in frustration, knowing he's the one who informed the Count of their movements previously, blaming himself for the death of his men. They try to calm him down, after all, the evil organization are the ones to blame. Ivy then observed that the time between their arrival here and Count Valtoria's was a little short. It couldn't have been simply by chance. One of the traitors must be hiding near this base to keep an eye on it. They then begin to wonder how all the evidence here could have been displaced, knowing there were still guards on the good side watching this base. So Ivy quickly concludes the places where the bad guards were instructed to search must be areas that contained evidence. It's just the bad guards didn't report any. They head to the room the front bad guard Malgalgela was in charge of and send him away with another task. While searching inside, Ivy's past life tells her there must be a secret in the bookcase, like in the movies. Uh, but Ivy has no idea what a movie is. She spots the only book where the corner of the spine is scuffed and decides to climb and push it, unlocking the magic door containing tons of hidden records. Inside, the gang finds incredible sums of money beyond any imagination of wealth. Berksby then finds records of the organization's business dealings, containing evidence of kidnappings. He then suggests that they put everything back so the organization believes they hadn't found the evidence yet. The next day, outside, everyone has been mulling over how big this whole operation really is. No one has been able to sleep, and with how dangerous everything is, they can't leave Ivy alone for any reason. So Latra follows Ivy while she does laundry. He then asks something he's been wondering for a while now. Is he really a boy? Upon hearing this, Ivy begins tearing up, but she's just sorry for deceiving all of them. However, Latra says it's fine, especially knowing it's more dangerous for girls to travel alone. He says it's better this way for now, and he'll pretend he doesn't know. But next to make her entrance is Mila of the Green Gale. She offers idle chit-chat, and to bring Ivy along to explore the town with her to find delicious sweets shops. Latra then invites himself, something that Mila protests, saying she wasn't inviting him, even with her seeming reluctant at first. She then says, Fine, all five of us can go, with her older brothers Tolto and Malma deviously walking in. Oh man, is there going to be an all-out war soon? Find out next week by subscribing to my channel. For now though, watch this next video. It's me, Comfy T. I'll see you all in the next one.